exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, uh, which is also listed in your program. You can also follow us on Instagram at JFK Junior Forum. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming tonight's guests, Ambassador Bill Burns, Ambassador Kathy Russell, and Professor Allison Graham. So thank you very much. Welcome tonight to the Harvard Forum, and it's a great honor uh, to welcome here tonight uh, uh, one of America's uh, uh, most outstanding diplomats, one of the great uh, international diplomats of this era. I think if Gilbert and Sullivan were writing one of their tunes, they would say the very model of a modern uh, diplomat. For students here at Harvard, uh, Bill offers a a great example of a role model uh, of a career in diplomatic practice mm -hmm. uh, and service. And I've had the opportunity to watch him and Kathy as well over uh, 33 years in public service as a foreign service officer uh, and interact with them often. And uh, I would say as a citizen, simply thank you. Thank you for a great service to the country. Uh, among the many accomplishments, let me just uh, underline one. Were it not for the back channel, which is the title chosen for this book, uh, that Bill uh, uh, operated during the Obama administration, uh, ultimately leading to the agreement with Iran in 2015, Iran would today either have nuclear weapons or Israel and the U.S. would have attacked Iran, and we would be still in our third war in the Middle East. So if that it was all he had done in 33 years, <laughs> that's something any human being should be extremely proud of, and that for those of us who had a chance to live our lives without either Iran having nuclear weapons or having a third war in the Middle East, uh, again, to say thank you. So you can read Bill's resume for yourself. Uh, uh, from my perspective, there's one big missing uh, chapter. Uh, uh, he was not uh, a graduate of the Kennedy School. Uh, <laughs> and for that, shame on us, okay? I would say we would be extremely proud had he had, he had been. Uh, just this month, uh, actually just two weeks ago, uh, Bill published a splendid new book here called The Back Channel, a memoir of American diplomacy and its case for renewal. Let me see here if these are working. Can you do a slide for me, please? Hello? Oh, wait, here we are. Uh, if the slides would... Ah, there you go. Yes, here's you know, without, <laughs> not maybe quite Russian yet. intelligence just produced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would like the one. No. Come back here. Sorry. There, not there one. should be a slide of the book uh, with the title of the book. Uh, in any case, here's Bill with Obama. Uh, and here is the book. <laughs> Having read this book and actually written a review of it, I would tell you it's a great read. There are about uh, 20 fascinating threads to it. And if you're trying to keep track of what's happened in American foreign policy in recent times, this is an insider's story uh, about the experiences through this whole period. So uh, if you were simply trying to understand what's happened since the fall of the Berlin Wall or what's happened since uh, the end of the Cold War, what's happened since the attack on Iraq. Uh, I would say a great read that can help you see it through a person's eyes who's actually there trying to do something. Uh, so uh, for tonight, for the 
rather than giving a speech about the book, Bill suggested it would be useful to just have a conversation. And so the format is that Kathy Russell, who we have the good fortune to have here at the Kennedy School as an IOP fellow this term, and who in one of her previous chapters served as the ambassador at large for global women's issues, while Bill was serving in the State Department, and I are going to engage Bill in conversation for about a half hour, uh, and then we're going to open it to the floor for other questions and answers. So first, let me just get you to join me in welcoming uh, one of America's outstanding diplomats, Bill Burns. So Kathy, why don't you kick okay, off the conversation? Great. Well, first, I, I have to just associate myself with everything you just said, because it was, I did have the honor of serving with Bill, which really was a treat. And I have to say, for people who worked in the State Department, Bill was just an icon. And it was fun to be there when he was there, because I knew him before I got there. And so I, you know, I, I would say, oh, something about Bill Burns, and people would be like, oh, Bill Burns, in kind of a whisper. And they would be like, Bill Burns said whatever. And, you know, and, and I think he's probably the only living person who has a, a room named after him at the State Department so it really he really was a very um, trusted and valued uh, person at the State Department so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your views about diplomacy and you talk about it in the book as the biggest asset and best kept secret um, and I, I'm I'm just curious about it now because I think we have a president who has a different different perspective about the value of diplomacy um, to, to put it generously. Um, and I think he doesn't perhaps see the value of the kind of diplomacy you have engaged in throughout your career. And, you know, we are lucky enough to be here with students who I think are considering the, whether to pursue a career the way you have. And I've had a lot of students come in and talk to me about that. Um, you know, should they go to the State Department? Is, is this a, a career that makes sense anymore? Is diplomacy a worthwhile way to, to go forward. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that now, given the change that we've seen in the Sure. In the <coughs> well, it's great to be with all of you, and especially nice to be on stage with two people, Kathy and Graham, for whom I have such respect. I mean, I guess, you know, as I look back over three and a half decades as a professional American diplomat, I've never seen a moment when diplomacy mattered more to advancing American interests in the world or been more adrift. And you know, by that I mean that you know, we live in an era in <coughs> which the United States is no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. With the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, huge global challenges beyond the capacity of any one state uh, to deal with, whether it's climate change, the biggest existential threat out there, or the revolution in technology. Um, I would still argue that the United States still has a better hand to play than any of our major rivals, and I mean that not just in terms of economic leverage and military leverage, but our capacity to draw on alliances uh, and to mobilize coalitions of countries to deal with these kind of problems. In a sense, that's what sets us apart from lonelier powers like China and Russia, um, if we play that hand wisely. And I think that's the challenge today because, and that gets to the drift part. And I would add that, you know, it's not as if Donald Trump invented the drift in American diplomacy. The truth is, in my experience anyway, since the end of the Cold War, administrations of both parties became a little bit complacent about how we'd get our way in the world. Diplomacy seemed, you know, less important in some respects. Then came 9-11, the huge shock to our system and a further investment in military and intelligence tools, oftentimes treating diplomacy as a kind of under-resourced afterthought. But what I do believe is that this White House, over the course of the last two and a half years now, has accelerated that drift and made the situation for diplomacy infinitely worse at precisely the moment when we need it most. And you know, you can measure that in terms of you know, the practical ways, you know, the, the sort of three successive budget proposals from the White House, each of which would have cut the State Department and the development assistance budget um, to historic lows. In the most recent proposal, you know, $40 billion was proposed for the State Department, for all of our diplom diplomats overseas, uh, and for all of our foreign assistance, and $750 billion for defense, so 19 times higher the last person to argue that you get very far in diplomacy without a strong military. 
but it's foolish to let that imbalance continue to, you know, to continue to increase. But alongside those practical problems, and, and they also include the fact that as Kathy knows very well from her work in the State Department, you know, we made painfully slow progress over the course of you know, my experience in government at trying to improve you know, gender and ethnic diversity in the Foreign Service so we'd look a little bit more like the society we, we represent. When I came into the Foreign Service in the early 1980s, nine out of 10 Foreign Service officers were white and less than a quarter were women. You know, by the time I left, the uh, gender balance had improved, but at the senior levels, you know, it, it was still um, not nearly where it should have been. But what's happened in the last two years is to reverse those trend lines. And then on top of that, you have the really pernicious practice of going after individual career officers because they worked on controversial issues in the last administration. And then the last thing I'd say, um, as a recovering diplomat, you can get me going on issues like this. But the last thing I would say is that, you know, alongside those tangible measures, you know, you have a president who has demonstrated a genuine disdain for professional expertise and for public service in a way. Um, so when the president was asked about a year and a half ago whether he was concerned about the record number of senior vacancies in the State Department, his response was not really because I'm the only one who matters. That's a diplomacy of narcissism, not institutions. And at this moment on the international landscape, it's not gonna get us where we need to go. Right. So would you do it again? If you were a sure. young person now, would you I go would. to the State Department? I, I would, and I'm not naive about it either. I mean, I understand not only the obstacles I just described in the current era, but you know, diplomacy is not a zero risk profession. You know, as we sit here this evening, there are lots of my former colleagues who are working in hard places doing hard work at considerable risk around the world. There are sacrifices for families. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, we have, my wife and I have two daughters in their early 20s and you know, they could tell you themselves. I mean, it's not an easy existence sometimes bouncing around from school to school. The State Department itself can be a frustrating place to work. Um, you know, while individual diplomats can be incredibly innovative and courageous and entrepreneurial, as an institution, the State Department is rarely accused of being too agile or too full of initiative. So it has its frustrations, but for me, it was an enormously rewarding profession. And I encourage you know, young people, and sometimes they're not so young because the average entering age in the Foreign Service today is 31. It's people I'm glad I didn't have to compete with to get into the Foreign Service because of their range of experiences. <coughs> but it, it was a wonderful experience for me. I, my dad, I remember I had taken the written exam for the Foreign Service at, our, at the old American Embassy in London. Um, and I remember in correspondence with my dad sort of wondering what I should do. My dad was a career army officer, spent 35 years in the US military. And he, I remember one line that he wrote to me was, nothing can make you prouder than to serve your country with honor. That didn't really register with me at the time, to be honest, but I genuinely spent the next three and a half decades discovering the wisdom of that advice. And so I think you know, the Foreign Service today, as is the Civil Service and the State Department, are filled with honorable, patriotic, hardworking people. And that's why um, you know, it really bugs me and pisses me off, to be honest with you, when I see you know, the efforts to belittle and to degrade public service at a time when, as I said before, I think it's more valuable than ever. So I'm not undecided on this. I think it's a wonderful profession um, and I think it can bring enormous rewards. Yeah. So the answer is do it. Okay. So let me uh, do a question about uh, Russia. Ah. Since... Uh, uh, Where you, most of my gray uh, hair came from. Yeah. You knew... <laughs> You knew Mr. Putin well, and know him well, and you actually have been a player in this story right through, uh, from the collapse of the Berlin Wall, when you were working for Jim Baker, mm -hmm. and the end of the Cold War with George H.W. Bush, and then as ambassador to Moscow, uh, as well as undersecretary and then deputy secretary. So as the review uh, I mean, the reviews of the book have been extremely positive, and they deserve the, the book deserves uh, positive reviews. But in the uh, the editor of the Financial Times reviewed the book himself, Lionel Barber, and 
under a, 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 a headline clearly in, intended as a double entendre, which is called the fallen superpower. And he points principally to the Russian story, but then in the book he says, or in the review, he proposes a, a different subtitle to the book. And he proposes to call it Present at the Destruction. Uh, David Ignatius, our colleague at the Washington Post, who's also part of the Belfer Center, also reviewed the book in glowing terms. But uh, he's, and he actually praises your candor in the, about what he calls the quote, chain of errors that helped undo the American century. So tell us what these two reviewers are responding to. Well, maybe I'll start, you start with Russia and sort of look at it in those yeah. terms as well. Um, and start with Vladimir Putin, who remains a kind of combustible combination of grievance and ambition and insecurity. I vividly remember my first meeting as the newly arrived US ambassador in Moscow with Putin. Um, you know, when you're a new ambassador, you come with a letter from the US president to present, in this case, to the president of Russia. And this ceremony takes place in the Kremlin. Um, which is a place that's built on a scale meant to intimidate, intimidate visitors and especially newly arrived um, ambassadors. So you go walking through these huge halls down long corridors and at the end of one hall, um, you come up against these two-story bronze doors. And you're kept waiting there for a little while, mostly to let this all sink in. Um, and then eventually the door opens a crack and out comes Vladimir Putin. Now, Putin, despite his bare-chested persona, is not that intimidating in the flesh. I mean, he's about 5'6", but he does carry himself with great self-assurance. And he came through the door and looking me dead in the eye, which is his habit, before I got a word out of my mouth, let alone hand over my letter, said, you Americans need to listen more. You can't have everything your own way anymore. We can have effective relations, but not just on your terms. And in my experience, that was vintage Putin. It was not subtle. Um, he had a big chip on his shoulder, and he was kind of defiantly charmless. Um, but the point there, I think, was this sense of grievance, this sense that the United States had taken advantage of Russia's moment of historical weakness in the 1990s. And I'm not trying to justify it, but I think if you want to understand Putin's Russia, it's the, a good starting point for understanding his smoldering aggressiveness is to understand the Russia of the 1990s, Boris Yeltsin's Russia, which was a mix of hope after the end of communism and the end of the Soviet Union and a sense of humiliation at how far Russia had fallen as a major power and disorder, an economy that was flat on its back. And Putin, in a sense, rode that discontent and that sense of grievance, which wasn't unique to him, it was shared across much of the Russian political elite. Um, and when he was, you know, by the time I was ambassador a decade ago, surfing on $130 a barrel oil, he was in a position to push back. And Putin, in my experience, has always been an apostle of payback. And so when he had an opportunity to push back, he did it. And so he drew a straight line from, you know, that you know, period of weakness in the 1990s through the color revolutions in Georgia 2003, Ukraine in 2004, our efforts, which, you know, as I write in the book, I think were a mistake in 2008 to push for formal opening of the door for Ukrainian and Georgian membership in NATO, all the way through the, you know, demonstrations in Moscow in the winter of 2011, 2012, when lots of, you know, irate, members of the Russian middle class who were upset that Putin had arbitrarily and kind of cavalierly decided he was going to come back to the Kremlin after a period as prime minister, demonstrated in the streets. Hillary Clinton, then the U.S. Secretary of State, made some public statements which we would have made in any society in the world in support of free expression and fair and open elections. Putin took this personally, which he tends to do. And that was, in many respects, the core of his animus to Hillary Clinton. And so fast forward to the 2016 US presidential elections. If Putin thought we had taken advantage of Russia's weakness in the 1990s, 
Here he saw a US political system badly polarized, dysfunctional in its own way, an opportunity to take advantage, to get even at relatively low cost. Hiring 200 hackers through Russian military intelligence doesn't cost you that much to take advantage of that chaos and so even greater dissension. So that the Putin that Putin's Russia um, allows us, I think, only a very narrow band of possibilities in relations from the sharply competitive to the nastily adversarial. But much as I think it's important for us not to give in to Putin's aggressiveness, it's important not to give up on the Russia beyond Putin. Because I do think there's a middle class in Russia that's restive today over you know, economic stagnation, a sense of absence of possibilities. It's not a revolutionary middle class, but it's a restive middle class. And I also think that Russians, as you look at over the next decade, are gonna chafe at being China's junior partner, just as they chafed at being the junior partner of the United States after the Cold War. So there's space for artful American diplomacy as you look ahead. But we need to strip away our illusions because throughout the period I was talking about, I think both we and the Russian leadership were guilty of illusions uh, from time to time. Not only about what's possible in the relationship, uh, but about ways in which we could get back at one another. And yeah, I think the relationship suffered as a result. There was bound to be a certain amount of friction just born of history. And I'm a big believer in, you know, in the lessons of history and dealing with you know, great power and major power relations. Um, but we both made mistakes along so, the Bill, way. So Bill, let me drill a little further on this because again, we could take a dozen of the points that you identify yeah. in the book as a mistake. Another interesting thing the book does is uh, have declassified 100 documents that were actually part of the activities at the time. So if we take the uh, premature push, as you call it, for mem NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine, in 2008 at the NATO summit, uh, the Bush administration and Condi, who was the secretary, uh, uh, pushed the Europeans uh, and got from them a statement that said the door for NATO membership, it says actually Georgia and Ukraine will become members of NATO, that's a quote. Two months before that, you wrote a memo to uh, Secretary Rice saying this is a dumb idea in diplomatese. Sort of, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's, here's <laughs> well, I can, phrase, I can yeah. read the document here. No, it, no, says, <laughs> it says, it says, if we do this, Madam Secretary, today's Russia will respond. The prospect of subsequent Russian-Georgian armed conflict would be high. That was the war that occurred between Russia and Georgia three months later that separated South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And next it says, this will create fertile soil for Russian meddling in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. That didn't come till 2014, 10 years later, but also happened. So what about that? I mean, I think several things. Um, you know, first, uh, I think it's important, you know, I was the ambassador in Russia. You know, we work as professional diplomats in a disciplined service, so you don't get to run out to the New York Times when you differ with policy, um, or you can resign, and I have huge respect for people who did that at different points in my career. But a part of your obligation in a disciplined profession is to be honest, I mean, even when it's not convenient, and that's what I was trying to do then. It's the job of an ambassador overseas or any diplomat overseas um, to point out concerns uh, about what the consequences of particular policy choices might be. And I, I was quite concerned at that, at that time about what in effect was leaving NATO expansion on autopilot. Um, and drawn from a period in the 90s and in the early 2000s when you know the truth was we could maneuver over or around Russian objections on most issues just because of the sheer weight of our power and influence. By 2008, that wasn't the case anymore. And so that's what I was trying to highlight. The advantage of, you know, through the work of Matan Chorev, who's a veteran of the Kennedy School and uh, a wonderful colleague, 
Um, we were able to get declassified around 120 documents because the temptation when you write something like this, I found, I'm sure I'm guilty of it as well, is to write what you wish you had said or what you wish you had recommended. So for better or worse, I was trying to ground this in what I, I, what I really said and thought and wrote at the time. And the documents are up on the website and yeah. you can read them yourself. And they're one long lesson in humility because for every document like that, you can see places where I wish I could take back what I recommended or what I said. But I think it's useful. If you want to try to bring diplomacy to life for a wider audience outside the Washington Beltway, it really helps, as, as Wendy Sherman did so well in her recent book, um, to make this a human narrative so that people can see you know, the ways in which we got things right and we got things wrong and the kind of debates that, you know, that we were having um, over the course of the years. Because diplomacy really is a pretty poorly understood profession. It does oftentimes operate in back channels, out of sight and out of mind. Um, and so putting those documents up and trying to tell stories, as I do in the book, is a way, I think, to to make it more accessible to people. Bill, what do you, what's your assessment of what happens in the near term with the U.S.-Russia relationship and with the U.S.-NATO relationship, mm. given the way the president looks at those two things now? Sure. Well, I mean, the U.S.-Russia relationship, you know, essentially we're managing an adversarial relationship, so we ought not to have illusions about that. But even in the sharpest adversarial relationship, it's important to have guardrails. Mm -hmm. You know, the, what's left of the old arms control architecture dating back to the late Soviet period is about to crumble. Not only the intermediate range nuclear forces agreement, the INF treaty, which is 20 years old, which is about to fall apart largely because of Russian violations, but the new START agreement, which was concluded in the Obama administration, which reduces and regulates and monitors strategic nuclear weapons, expires at the beginning of 2021. And on the pace we're on now, that's also going to die on the vine. And I think that would be a huge disadvantage, not just for the US and Russia, but for the rest of the world at a time when we're trying to make the argument against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So, you know, we need to be mindful of those guardrails in US-Russia relations in the short term. Um, there, are, there are other areas where we can do business with the Russians cold-bloodedly in Afghanistan. You know, they have a stake in some kind of stability in Afghanistan and the negotiations that are going on now, as do a lot of the other sometimes creepy neighbors of Afghanistan like Iran and Pakistan. It's important for us to talk to them because you know, we ought to play on what is a shared set of interests there, and the Russians are one of those parties. And the US and NATO, which NATO is about to you know, celebrate its 70th anniversary, I think this is a moment when the United States and this administration is really running the risk of um, abandoning the kind of enlightened self-interest that animated American policy at its best over the last 70 years. And we weren't always at our best. But it was that sense that our interests are best served by widening the circle of countries that more or less share them and then trying to work with them effectively. President Trump has turned that on its head with a kind of muscular unilateralism which disparages alliances like NATO and tends to see the United States sort of like as Gulliver tied down by the Lilliputians. You know, we're better off if we can throw off those bonds. <coughs> and I, I just think that fundamentally, fundamentally misreads the landscape that we're on today, which is more crowded and contested than any time in my professional experience, and misreads what are our biggest assets, what sets us apart from other powers like Russia and China, and that's alliances, in particular NATO, um, and our capacity to mobilize other countries. And the president, you know, with, you know, the sort of um, ruminating about shifting the burden of um, defense spending in NATO, which is a very sensible thing to do. He's not the first president to think of that, but it's, he's right to push that so that the Germans and others bear more of, of that defense burden. But where I think he's wrong is to disparage the whole idea of the alliance on the one hand, and on the other hand, to ruminate, as I said before, about ideas like basically getting our European allies to pay the full burden of US defense deployments and then charge an additional 50%, which may work in New York real estate, but it's a protection racket. 
you know, I mean, in terms of how we're dealing with allies. This is not a favor to our European allies. It benefits both of us, and you know, that's what I think we risk on the eve of the 70th anniversary of NATO. So let me, f let me follow up that one with the question that Nick Burns, you don't, you don't have to be named Burns to be a, <laughs> an outstanding diplomatic practitioner. I mean, good but company. Nick Burns, our colleague here, who unfortunately is uh, out of the country today, who would normally be doing this, runs our uh, Future of Diplomacy project. And so uh, I asked Nick, what question would he ask you, which follows up exactly Kathy's question. He says, quote, we have a deteriorating relationship with the two great authoritarian powers, Russia and China. A challenge for diplomacy is to compete with both while at the same time keeping the door open for contact and negotiation. How best to balance competition and dialogue and even partnership on some issues like climate change mm -hmm. with Putin and Xi? Well, that's, I mean, as Nick rightly describes, you know, that's, that's what diplomacy is all about. In major power relations, it's managing the gray area between peace and war. It's managing very complicated relationships that inevitably are a mix of the adversarial and on some occasions at least the cooperative. Um, it's about mobilizing other countries who share our concerns. So that's why, you know, I mean, Graham mm -hmm. has written eloquently for many years about China's rise, which is the single most consequential challenge for the United States and for international order far out as I can see into the 21st century. There are some who argue that containing China, kind of on the model of the Cold War, you know, ought to be what frames our approach. I don't agree with that. And I don't say that because I have illusions about the nature of the threat that China poses in some ways to our interests or the nature of our competition. I say that because I think the more sensible approach for the United States is to try to shape the environment into which China rises. And there we have a lot of assets. You know, there are a lot of countries from India all the way east through Southeast Asia to our traditional allies in Northeast Asia that share a concern that China's rise not come at the expense of everybody else's prosperity and security. So we ought to take advantage of that web of countries as well as institutions. And that's where I think it was a profound mistake early in the Trump administration to bail out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the big trade agreement that would have, you know, knit together 40% of the global economy across Asia. Was it a perfect trade agreement? No. Perfect is rarely on the menu for trade agreements, for diplomacy in general. But it would have provided a framework of relatively high-end standards in trade and investment which would have helped shape China's incentives and disincentives over time, given its entanglement in the global economy as well. So President Trump is right to push back against predatory Chinese trade and investment practices. In some ways, that effort is long overdue. Where I think he's wrong is A, tactically, not making common cause with other countries who share that concern, like Japan and the European Union. Instead, we've launched second and third front trade conflicts over steel and aluminum with them. And I think it's wrong also in that you need to couple a defensive strategy, pushing back against those practices, with an affirmative vision of what's the kind of Asia that we want to see. And that's where the Trans-Pacific Pacific Partnership was, I think, a valuable ingredient as well. So that's, you know, that's part of the way in which I think, you know, a sensible American foreign policy would deal with that single most consequential challenge for the United States. Okay. I, I think Nick is teaching a course on this. So we'll, <laughs> for the students in this course who aren't here, we'll tell them just to watch the forum video, which <laughs> is actually up on the forum's website. Kathy, why don't you... Uh, Maybe do one more question, I, I and then, one more question. then we're going to come to the audience quite soon. And just the warner, since we have another consummate diplomat here, Wendy Sherman, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask her to say a comment or a question first, if that's okay. okay. I apologize. Okay. Um, I, I've I've always been curious and uh, about um, what happened, and I don't know how much you can how much you can tell us about this, but really, what was the decision making around? the Iraq war. Mm. I, I, you know, when you look at all of the problems in the Middle East now, I, I mean, they're not all as a result of the Iraq war. Certainly that's been a very contentious area for a long time, but so many problems have, have really followed that decision um, to go after Saddam Hussein, to mm -hmm. go into, and, and I'm just curious about 
what, what surrounded that decision and what your thinking was at the time and what your thinking is about it now. Sure. Um, While well, writing about that you know, episode in my own checkered diplomatic career was the most painful thing I did in this book because you know, that was the Iraq War in 2003, I think, you know, the biggest tragedy in American foreign policy, the biggest mistake, at least over the course of my lifetime as a diplomat. And, and I you know, ran the Middle East Bureau for Colin Powell in the State Department during that period, so I shared in a lot of that as well. Um, I guess I'd say several things about the origins of the decision or the rush to war. I mean, 9-11 uh, had a huge impact on, not surprisingly, on the way in which President Bush, the way in which that administration, the way in which lots of us have, as Americans looked at our role in the world. I think for President Bush, his mission after 9-11, by contrast to you know, a lot of you know, what he expressed in the campaign in 2000 and in the pre-9-11 period in the Bush 43 administration, which was all about the U.S. military doesn't do nation building overseas, you know, that we need to be careful about how we throw our weight around in the world, a much more, you know, realistic in a sense policy similar to the, you know, the policies of George H.W. Bush and Baker and Scowcroft and the people around him. 9-11 changed a lot of that. And I think the president, for understandable human reasons, saw his mission, and he was channeling the views of a lot of Americans as ensuring that this would never happen again. And so the, the predilection was for prevention. In other words, this was not the season for the kind of nuance and you know, arguments that you know, we were trying to make in the State Department at that point about how do you take advantage of this hinge point after 9-11 where there was this outpouring of sympathy and support from countries around the world. That was one strand. A second strand was, you know, the, the view of a lot of neoconservatives um, in uh, the Bush 43 administration, um, whose view was quite ambitious, in my experience, untethered to history, mm -hmm. um, ambitious in the sense that, you know, they viewed the toppling of Saddam Hussein through U.S. military force as the way to transform the Middle East. You know, that this was a way um, to sort of change the equation to sow the seeds for democracy in other Arab states. As, as I said, I think a profoundly mistaken view, but a powerful strand at that time. And then a third strand was what you could call sort of the paleo-conservative view, which I always associated more with Vice President Cheney and Don Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense. They weren't buying into the neoconservative argument about transforming the Middle East. Their view, it seemed to me, was much more that toppling the Taliban in Afghanistan after 9-11 was necessary but not sufficient. That if you wanted to deter attacks in the future from Al-Qaeda or other acronyms, um, you had to hit back harder. And that Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which had been a, you know, painful thorn in the side of the United States and lots of other players in the region for a long time was the way to deliver that message. And so all of those strands, I think, came together. And, you know, we, I talked before about the importance of discipline and honesty and the professional diplomatic service in the Near East Bureau. We tried to be honest about our concerns. I still to this day fault myself for not being, um, you know, eloquent enough or pushing hard enough you know, to make clear the depth of our concerns. But I remember one afternoon in the summer of 2002, two colleagues of mine and I, Ryan Crocker, a terrific diplomat, and David Pierce, another terrific diplomat, had the most depressing brainstorming session of our careers over a couple hours. What we tried to do was list all the things that could go wrong on the day after mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein was toppled, and we titled it The Perfect Storm. Now, rereading it, and you can also look at it for better or worse on the Carnegie website now, we got some things right and some things wrong. We underestimated a lot of things. We overestimated others. But it was an honest, if imperfect, effort uh, to try to puncture the incredibly rosy assumptions that advocates of the war were making. And, um, and, and I offer it not as a perfect illustration of anything, because you know, you reread it, it's not really a coherent memo. It's a kind of hurried list of horribles. But it was meant to try to express honestly what our concerns were. And obviously, it was a dismal failure. It had no impact on the course of the war. And we've all learned some very painful lessons since then because, Kathy, just as you said, you know, 
The Iraq War in 2003 was not the source of all the dysfunctions in the Arab world, but it accelerated them and made many of them a lot worse. So just to underline again, if you look at the, uh, go to the website, you can read this memo. I have it here. It's uh, February 14, 2002. It's a pretty good memo. Uh, it, was some, it was the summer. Uh, I don't know where they got uh, it. I think it's a different, that's a different one. But this, anyway. This one says, regional, this is in, in, in diplomacy, you learn to write in a special form, I okay? think. <laughs> uh, regional concerns regarding regime change in Iraq. <laughs> it goes on to say this will be a disaster, but it puts it in nicer terms and begins to enumerate what those would consist of. Yeah, most Arab leaders at that time, because, you know, as the assistant secretary for the Near East, I was traveling a lot in the Middle East, and it's fair to say that most Arab leaders were containing their enthusiasm for the rush <laughs> to war in Iraq at that time. Yeah. So one of the exciting things about the forum is that you never know who's sitting beside you. And I remember when, after we created the forum, I remember an event in which we had a forum like this, and... Um, in the course of the conversation, somebody got up and stood up at the thing, and Walter Cronkite wanted to ask a question. And Teddy said, uh, Teddy Kenny said, how exciting this is. So, Wendy Sherman, uh, Wendy is the new... Walter Cronkite, Wendy Sherman. Wendy, Wendy's the new uh, uh, director of the Leadership Center at the school. She's just recently arrived, but she worked with Bill extremely closely as the Under Secretary of State uh, for Policy in the period of... A, Iraq, uh, sorry, of the Iran deal, among other things. So, Wendy. Thank you. So, I'm only going to take a moment because really the students should have an opportunity to ask Bill a question. I want to say two things. One, much of what I know about being a diplomat, I learned from Bill Burns. He is really the consummate diplomat that we all have relied on to show us the way. So, it's wonderful to be able to publicly thank you for being such a good teacher and colleague. Best word at, I ever learned at the State Department was colleague, um, and Bill is the best. Um, my question to you, because I am now doing the uh, Center for Public Leadership here at the Kennedy School, you have met with and sat across the table from a lot of leaders, both in our country and around the world. What are the qualities that you think make for the most principled, effective leaders? It's a really good question, and as you know, the feeling is entirely mutual, Wendy. Um, I learned at least as much from you as you learned from me. Um, you know, I met lots of leaders in the course of my career, um, you know, from the genuinely weird like Muammar Gaddafi um, to, you know, to a lot of leaders for whom I have great admiration, King Hussein in Jordan, who died six months after, you know, I became ambassador to Jordan. And, you know, the best of leaders in our country and overseas that you encounter are honest. You know, they're, will, they're honest with themselves first. Um, they're good at asking kind of second and third order consequences questions. Um, they're good at connecting ends to means, and we oftentimes get ourselves in trouble in American diplomacy when we don't do that very effectively. Um, they have an understanding of the limits of their own agency which is a challenge oftentimes, you know, for American leaders as well, especially coming out of what some people call the unipolar American moment, when it just didn't seem as if there were many breaks on our influence or power in the world. Um, they have a respect for the expertise and the advice of people around them. You know, it's rare that you see leaders who genuinely, effective leaders who genuinely believe that they can do everything themselves. There are certain choices that you know, only they can make. That's the problem if you're the President of the United States. You only get to make the 5149 calls. All the 9010 calls get made much lower down in the system. But there's a respect for the expertise, especially of career people, because you realize that unless they feel that they're in on the takeoff, most of your policy landings are going to be really messy as well. Um, so those are, you know, those are among the qualities, not just in American leaders, but, you know, in, in lots of the best leaders I've seen in the world, the non muammar Gaddafi leaders. So if you'll stand up at the microphone, the questions, uh, introduce yourself. Question starts uh, briefly with a, ends with an it, with a question mark, please. My name is Eugene Kogan. I work for uh, Nick Burns uh, nice here, the other Ambassador Burns. 
Um, he has a Secretaries of State project here where uh -huh. he interviews Secretaries of State. I know you've worked for a number of them. And I'm curious uh, if you would maybe talk about one or two who were particularly good negotiators and sure. maybe with an example. Yeah, I mean, you know, I worked early in my career. In fact, I began the book talking about my experience as a relatively young diplomat working for Secretary of State Baker, James Baker, who was as fine a negotiator, at least, as I ever learned from. Now, y you have to understand that, you know, he and President George H.W. Bush and Brent Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor, were operating at a moment, you know, when the United States was the singular dominant player in the international system. So they had a pretty strong hand to play, but they played it with uncommon skill. And I remember Baker, you know, after Desert Storm uh, and the expulsion of the Iraqis from Kuwait, you know, Baker set off on a long effort to organize the Madrid Peace Conference between Arabs and Israelis. And it's easy to think in hindsight, because all of us are so much smarter in hindsight when we leave government, um, that that was foreordained. Baker has a whole wall outside his office in Houston today covered with cartoons from US newspapers in the period, most of which poked fun at what people saw to be this quixotic effort to produce for the first time a conference which would have Arabs and Israelis and Palestinians sitting at the same table, organized around the same terms of reference for negotiations. But he pulled it off, and he did it in the face of some really difficult regional leaders. Hafez al-Assad, then the leader of Syria, the bloody dictator of Syria, the father of the current bloody dictator of Syria, Bashar <laughs> al-Assad. Um, I remember one time, being with Baker in a nine-hour meeting with Hafez al-Assad, literally nine hours straight through. And Assad, I always thought, had this surgically improved bladder because <laughs> he would sit there and, you know, cup after cup of sweet Arabic tea would be served. And Baker was absolutely determined, no surgery, but that he wasn't going to budge. <laughs> and so the two of them were in this kind of contest, and our, our ambassador at the time in Damascus, a wonderful diplomat named Ed Jeregian, cracked about four hours in <laughs> and invented this excuse about an urgent phone call. And he had urgent business, but it wasn't a phone call. <laughs> so that gave Assad and Baker the opportunity for the next 40 minutes to make fun of weak diplomats you know, with weak bladders. <laughs> but I say that only because people forget sometimes that as Wendy knows very well, that negotiations are oftentimes about persistence, too. And you know, Baker was not only incredibly well organized, he had a sense of his opposite number, you know, how far they could go and how far they couldn't, but he was persistent, too. Um, and he demonstrated that in pulling off the Madrid Peace Conference. Madeleine Albright, by, by the way, called it bladder diplomacy. So. Right. No, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, unfortunately, and maybe there is a secret here, because uh, when Madeleine Albright was here talking about uh, some of her negotiations, she emphasized as well that she had a very tough bladder that allowed her to sit longer than some of the people she'd been negotiating right, it's, it's, with. It's not so part of the I'm entry I'm not sure if that's part of the <laughs> Foreign Service <laughs> entry test. Uh, yes, sir. And then we'll come there. Yes. Uh, Isaac Hi. Rose Berman, undergraduate. Uh, Hi. Mr. Burns, in your book, you advocate for increased cooperation between the government and the state to, and the government and the private sector yeah. uh, to kind of demonstrate that the State Department has economic legitimacy. Uh, in an era where many are wary of globalization, won't they just see that as more elite insider crony capitalism? Could be. I mean, it could be. And I, and I think, you know, one of the starting points for trying to repair American diplomacy is to understand honestly the disconnect that exists in our own country between people like me, you know, card carrying members of the Washington establishment, and lots of American citizens who, when we preach the gospel of disciplined American leadership in the world, they don't need to be persuaded, in my experience, about the importance of American engagement in the world but they're skeptical about the discipline part because of some of the mistakes that we've made. I do think it's extremely important as you look at American diplomacy in the years ahead to better integrate economic issues and wider national security issues. Through administrations I've worked over many years, you know, some have done better than others at that, but in general, we have a long way to go. I think we need to work more effectively you know, not just with the U.S. Congress, but with mayors and governors, as well as people outside government, civil society groups, whether it's, you know, as Kathy demonstrated so well during her years in the State Department, 
working with a range of civil societies groups that are going to promote women's rights in other parts of the world. You know, when I came into the Foreign Service, diplomacy seemed at least to be largely about relations between governments. Over the course of those 35 years, it became increasingly clear that that was part of the challenge, but the other part was links between societies as well, so we need to do better there as well. But there's a lot of skepticism, you're right, and that we're going to have to overcome in the future. Kevin, do you want to say a word about the links in the society that, since that was part of your agenda? Yeah. Well, I think the interesting thing from, from my perspective is to see the evolution, just as you're saying, in, in the way we saw these issues. And um, I think um, President Obama, Secretary Clinton, really understood that for the United States, it was in our strategic interest to support women and girls around the world because it, doing that made societies stronger and more reliable, more economically prosperous, and so better actors on the international stage. And so we saw it not just as the right thing to do, but really as in our interest to do. And so I think broadening the idea and the understanding of diplomacy, broadening the idea of internet of what American interest was, mm -hmm. is really an important evolution in, in our diplomatic ideas. And I think Secretary Clinton did a really good job. Secretary Kerry continued that. And I think that I'm hoping that that's, the, that's something that will continue in the future as, as we think about American diplomacy. Okay, this gentleman in the lodge. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Matt. I'm a junior at the college. Hi. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for coming. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how you see organizations like Carnegie and civil society, like the media and the legislative branch in pushing back against this administration's foreign policy and what limits or dangers do you see um, uh, within that? Well, I mean, I think you have to be honest about concerns. And by that, what I mean is honest to not, you know, you can tell from my earlier comments, I'm not a big fan of this White House. But I mean, to be honest about the drift, for example, American diplomacy that predated, you know, this White House. Because you have to understand that um, in, in order to understand that, in my view anyway, seeing the back of the current president is not going to solve all these problems. It'll help, in my view. But you know, there are lots of other challenges that we need to take very seriously, including in terms of the State Department itself and reforms that are necessary. Um, second, we have to be honest, I think, about you know, trying to repair that disconnect between many American citizens, at least, and the Washington establishment. We have to be honest about the fact that we are living and operating in a post-primacy world. You know, we are no longer the single unrivaled power in the world. We still have a strong hand to play, as I mentioned before. And then finally, you know, we have to be honest about the ways in which an imbalance has developed in the tools of American statecraft, you know, with diplomacy, I think, being treated as kind of an under-resourced afterthought. And so that's a role that, you know, you can play outside of government, which I think is, is valuable as well, to make the case not just born of criticisms of the current White House, but a kind of affirmative vision of the way in which the United States can operate effectively, and I'm optimist about that in the future. This gentleman, please. Hi, Jay Gleason. Hi. Hi, how are you? One of the most uh, incredulous instances of uh, the president's uh, quote-unquote muscular unilateralism came on Monday when he declared uh, that the Occupy Golan Heights uh -huh. uh, actually uh, belong to Israel now under its full sovereignty. No other country in the world agreed with that. And this came shortly after, of course, he moved the U.S. Embassy, which mm -hmm. almost no other country in the world uh, also agreed with. Uh, both in 81 and, and two years ago in 2016, the Security Council reaffirmed mm -hmm. that there's no legal effect uh, for Israel uh, claiming sovereignty uh, over the Golan Heights. Uh, so this is a kind of trend line that makes you wonder. Uh, it's seen in, in many other instances as well, but does Israel really have too much influence over American diplomacy? Is it, is it tending to uh, distort it and uh, misdirect it on uh, many occasions uh, in harmful ways, both for ourselves and for other people in the region? Well, I mean, good. I think that... Good question. Good. Sorry. Yeah, the, I mean, the specific question you raised about the goal on, I mean, I think what the president announced earlier this week uh, creates more problems than it solves. I mean, here's the reality. You know, if you look at the bloody chaos in Syria today, there is zero pressure on Israel, nor should there be right now, to come off the Golan Heights, which Israel has controlled for more than half a century. So in practical terms, you know, that formal recognition of Israel's annexation provides no practical security benefit for Israel. Maybe it provides a political boost for Prime Minister Netanyahu in a contested re-election campaign. 
But it creates some problems too. I mean, one is it's a favor in a way to Bashar al-Assad, to Hezbollah, to the Iranians, who love the idea of changing the subject from their own bloody repression of Syrians to you know, their resistance to, uh, to Israel and occupation. And second, it creates a lousy precedent as well, or reinforces a lousy precedent. I know international law is much disparaged, but it does matter sometimes. I can assure you that the first person who's gonna use this as a precedent is Vladimir Putin, Putin yeah. because his argument is gonna be, how can you criticize <coughs> my annexation of Crimea when you're acknowledging, you know, formally Israel's annexation of Golan? So you know, I think for all those reasons, those kind of steps, you know, don't do a service to the prospects of an enduring Arab-Israeli peace, let alone a two-state solution between Israelis and Palestinians. And I fear that, you know, with all the talk of the deal of the century that the White House is gonna launch, that it's gonna end up putting the last nail in the coffin of a two-state solution, because as far as I understand it, it's based on a lot of flawed assumptions that you can only deal with one party to the conflict, in effect, to make progress, because the administration hasn't had any real dialogue with Palestinians for a year. Second, the flawed assumption that you know somehow you can negotiate over the heads of Palestinians. Arab states can substitute for that. I don't buy that either, even though I think the idea of normal relations between Israel and Arab states is a, is a fine thing and we ought to promote it, but it's not a substitute for Israelis and Palestinians negotiating. There's a flawed assumption that somehow you can substitute economic incentives for political dignity and you can create some new Marshall Plan and Palestinians are gonna set aside the notion of a sovereign state. And a flawed assumption, I think, finally, that you know, time is on our side. I don't think time is on our side. Even if you look narrowly at our interest in supporting a Jewish democratic state in Israel, Play this out five or 10 years. In the land that Israel controls from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, Arabs are gonna be in a majority in that period. Um, and how do you sustain you know, a Jewish democratic state you know, in, in a situation in which there are lots of people in the territories that you control who are second class citizens at best? So for all those reasons, I think there needs to be a sense of urgency in looking at these issues and we need to stop shooting ourselves in the foot, which is what I think the decision to formally recognize the Golan was. So good question and splendid answer. I think uh, if the title of this uh, event tonight was what is diplomacy good for? And if the question was what about the Golan Heights? I think we've had a pretty good demonstration of why I wish you were making the policy rather than the way that it's being made. Let me apologize to the other folks that are up, we're coming to the witching hour, but if you run up quickly, Bill might take a question. Let's say thank you very much to a great public servant. <laughs>